So today I want to talk about Rikers Island and the current prison crisis. If you're unfamiliar with Rikers Island, I, Rikers Island contains New York City's primary jail complex. And like many prisons across the United States right now, there's a crisis going on. I am actually not talking about the shortage of correctional officers that's been centered on in a lot of media reports as of late, although I do believe that will be a factor in what I want to talk about today. Instead, I want to talk about the conditions imprisoned individuals are currently enduring as of late, which has just magnified the terrible realities that have already existed in the prison industrial complex. I also want to add that while I am centering this video on Rikers Island, it's far from the only place experiencing something like this, and while it may not match one-to-one -one in a lot of different locations, it should be assumed that similar things are happening in a lot of other places across the country. So with that said, I think there's no better place to start than to look at some of the perspectives of people who just got out of Rikers to explore what's been happening. So we have an article here from Curbed that talks about what it's like at Rikers, according to people who just got out. They're not feeding people, there's no water, no showers, no phone calls. Uh, we have the perspective of three different people who were recently released from Rikers, and I just want to share some of their stories before moving forward, because it tells us a lot about what's going on. We have here Cameron, 21 years old, released on September 9th. I was in intake for a week. Rikers is really bad right now. There's no CEOs. They're not feeding people. There's no water, no showers, no phone calls. There's people there that haven't took showers in two weeks or longer. You barely eat and they don't care. There were people in cells having seizures and they just left them there. I was in a cell with about 30 other people. You could be sleeping and they'd spray mace or come banging on the cells for no reason. You just wake up. You've got CEOs talking about how they own us and can do whatever they want to us. I got tested for COVID four days in. No one in the cell had a mask. People were asking, but they wouldn't give them to us. People said they were going to call 311. The inmates come together to help each other. The inmates is, one, is the ones that's feeding us and helping each other. The CEOs don't do nothing. We ate twice a day. We shared food. Some days they'd only give you hard stale bread. I couldn't call nobody. My mom was worried. So this is the account of one particular person who's describing conditions that are horrific. No food, no water, no showers, no phone calls, people having seizures and needing medical assistance and having it denied to them, people being crowded together, 30 people in a single cell during the middle of a pandemic, people not getting tested for COVID while they're in those cells, no one having a mask, and in addition, the CEOs continuing to do exactly what they've always done, harass inmates, banging on cells, spraying people with mace, and generally treating people like crap because the CEOs never see people who are incarcerated as people. Now we have Mr. K58 released September 10th going through a lot of his stuff. He describes a lot of the same stuff about the CEOs and what they're going through. But in addition, he uh, adds, they need to be trained how to be professional and to deal with people psychologically. But some of them just don't do their job. I've seen guys get beat up and officers just spray them all with mace and leave. They need to reform bail for real though. Everybody on the street don't be having that type of money. We don't have those resources. I'm poor, you know. If you're living in the projects, how are you going to get a thousand dollars? So this person's describing another aspect of this, which will be something we see repeated as we go through this. The amount of bail money that's being set for people is absurdly high. And if you're someone who, again, is living in the projects like he describes, you're someone who is in a place where they've just been in prison, or you're someone who just generally is in poverty and can't afford things like a thousand dollar expense, how are you supposed to pay your bail? And they specifically are picking high bail amounts for certain crimes to make sure that people stay in the system. And that is backing things up and causing a lot of harm. In addition, uh, this person points out something very important. What a lot of people need is to be dealt with in a manner that deals with them in a, in a professional and psychologically 
sound manner, not abusing people, not spraying them with mace. And this is why when a lot of people talk about defunding the police or dismantling, dismantling the prison industrial complex, nobody is saying that people shouldn't get care, but we should actually be putting people in institutions that will actually provide them mental health care at the very least, and not put them in prisons where they're mistreated all the time and consistently abused, because that's not helping anybody. Um, and when we move forward to this third person, Mateo, 20 years old, released on September 19th, they, they say they got to Rikers at 3 a.m. I was kept in intake the whole time, five days. They were just stuffing more and more prisoners up to 32 to 38 people in the cell without being tested for COVID. They wouldn't bring us water if we needed it. They wouldn't feed us. If the correction officers were mad, they would just come look at us, uh, even if somebody was passing out. There, were, uh, there was a guy who had asthma showing them there was nothing inside his inhaler on the floor grabbing his chest and they just looked at him. There was another man who was 61 who had diabetes and who was not offered insulin the entire time he was there. One CEO CO said, all right, you want to talk shit? Nobody's here is seeing a medic to, until Sunday. I run your life. Your life is in my hands. So these CEOs, these correction officers who, you know, are the ones being centered in the media as, you know, being uh, going through a shortage and being short, you know, staffed and all this other stuff. They're the ones who are completely abusing people as they always have and as they always will continue to do, showing their power trips by preventing people from getting access to medical care. By having someone who has asthma, someone who needed insulin from be not being able to get it, and by basically threatening... You're not going to see a medic until I let you. Because it's a power trip. And again, another account that describes the 32 to 38 people in a cell and everything like that. And when we move forward a little bit, a lot of people were saying, I've been in intake for three weeks, two weeks, not even getting a bed or nothing. Some cells didn't even have mats in them. But the ones that did have bed bugs. It was wild and gross. It never, it felt never ending. They weren't giving us phone calls, so we weren't able to speak to family members. When they would give us a meals, it was just those little cereals you get in, the, in middle school. Honestly, man, they just need to shut this place down. And then they, uh, this person describes, you can't be mad at a dog you made rabbit. And that phrase honestly gives me chills. Because the fact of the matter is, is they create the structures and institutions that put people in those cells. They purposefully design it in that way. And then when people are put in those cells and they're caged up and they, you know, quote unquote, misbehave in such a way that the COs want to, you know, enact their, uh, you know, violence towards the prisoners and these, these people who have been incarcerated, they act like they didn't create this, that they didn't create the structure that has a bunch of people literally caged in a cell, and then you are shocked that they act like they're angry and they're frustrated and that they're in pain and that they're suffering. And honestly, places like Rikers do need to be shut down. The prison industrial complex needs to be absolutely demolished. When we move forward into certain other articles, um, now that we've seen the accounts of some people who were there, I want to give an account of someone who visited and was talking about it. Um, people were just laying in filth. There was one man in a cell. What they called a cell was actually a shower. So you had a person in basically a small shower cell cubicle who couldn't sit and couldn't lie down. I didn't know if it was urine or water that was keeping this person wet. They were just naked. I saw a cell that should have had two or three people with six people. They had a bag which they were sharing as a bathroom because the toilet wasn't working. And of course, they didn't bring in anyone to fix that. People who should have been moved within 24 hours were there seven and eight days. There were HIV patients, mental health patients who hadn't gotten their medication in weeks. And of course, we know the effects that that can have. And so you had mental health patients, HIV patients, in addition to everything else that we've talked about, getting denied their medicine. You had people literally in terrifying conditions. And on top of that, this is leading to really the horrible part about this. And it, the fact that this gets worse than what we've just described, 14 people have died this year alone 
from the conditions in Rikers Island. One person tried to hang himself um, after he was given a bail of $15,000 cash and could not afford it. And when we look more into what this person went through, they were a grandfather who struggled with mental illness and could not afford the $15,000 bail and then proceeded to try to kill himself and then had to be taken off life support days later where he died. And this is just one of many who have either attempted suicide or have died from other means such as potentially COVID while being incarcerated at Rikers Island this past year. And the fact of the matter is this just keeps proving what we've been saying all along is that these facilities need to be shut down in favor of mental health institutions that actually cater to people and what they need. We have another instance where the 13th person to, to die this year was someone who contracted the coronavirus while waiting, awaiting a trial on weapons charges after being unable to post a $100,000 bail. You see this pattern here with these exorbitantly high bail costs where people are not able to afford it. Um, and again, this is primarily going to be people in New York City who are people who are probably people of color, are probably poor, are probably unable to pay any of these. Um, and when we look at the uh, response from the chief medical officer, and this is as of September 10th, the chief medal, uh, medical officer of the city's correctional health services is asking city council to request state or federal assistance. In the last year, at this point in time, only 10 people had died, including five who had committed suicide. What they had uh, chosen to do uh, is basically ask for additional assistance because all of this was just a threat to the people who worked in the prisons as well as the people who were incarcerated in the prisons. And there was a breakdown between healthcare workers and the correction officers. And the response to all of this was, well, we just need to hire more people. We need to hire more correction officers. Mayor Bill de Blasio and Department of, Commi uh, Department of uh, Commissioner Vincent uh, Chiraldi uh, have rolled out a plan to solve the crisis, including the hiring of an additional 600 officers, uh, where they were trying to get officers back to work. The same correctional officers that places like the Times have really centered as the true victims in all of this because they're not they're being overworked and all this stuff. But the fact of the matter is these institutions shouldn't be existing in the first place, and it means that the prisoners are being mistreated in much greater ways. And to me, that's the main part of the story. Despite that, many of the administration's solutions are on a timeline still months away, and advocates say immediate action is necessary to improve conditions. The Correction Officers Union maintain that guards are overworked, many of them pulling double or even triple shifts, while others are forced to take, off, uh, take time off to recover from serious injuries. They say the blame lies with the mayor and leadership at the Department of Corrections. And... So in all of this, I think it's really important to note that this is the type of thing that we're seeing in a lot of media sources where the guards are being positioned as the main focus for all of this. But to me, it's the inmates because they are constantly put in positions where they are being abused by the correction officers and where they are put in places where they are not getting access to the things they need to survive. Now, um, there's another incident that happened uh, where the governor had actually of New York had actually announced to plan to uh, move 230 women and transgender inmates from the Rikers Island complex to maximum security prisons in Westchester County, meaning that you now had a bunch of people being transferred who may or may not have been sentenced and likely were not sentenced with any sort of crime being transferred to a maximum security state prison because they wanted to take all of the people watching over the um, these particular people and move them and allow them to handle uh, the other people still on Rikers Island. Now, I can... It's frustrating that I have to go through this, 
But the fact of the matter is, is moving these uh, individuals to a maximum security prison means it's going to be even more difficult for families to get access to seeing people. It means they're going to be even further isolated. And it means that they are going to be subject to the conditions of a maximum security prison after not being sentenced. This isn't the solution. The solution is to decarcerate and to move people out of these prisons. It's not to move them into the next level up of prisons. And it's just frustrating that we keep seeing instances like this where the solution is hire more people, uh, move people into more, you know, strict security and institutions, rather than talking about the real solution that's very apparent, which is shutting these institutions down. Now, there have been a number of protests and advocacy groups, uh, as well as family members of inmates that have rallied outside of the Bronx Hall of Justice to call for Rikers Island to be closed and the Bronx District Attorney to stop requesting unpayable bails from inmates. And that's been a huge issue throughout all of this. People are getting funneled into this system. And it's basically transpiring where people are given bails that they can't pay and they get funneled into the system where the prison is already overcrowded. And then from there, we end up finding that people are not being fed and not being cared for. And from that, people are dying, getting sick, and that's what we're seeing. And it's it's horrific. These are the conditions that we have. And this is on top of the or you know the the rampant abuse that is done by correctional officers, the rampant abuse that is uh, constantly um, put on people who are incarcerated. And just so I make it clear, because I mentioned it at the beginning, but this is not the only place where this is happening. Uh, federal corrections officers jobs about one third of them are vacant and it's forced prisons to use cooks teachers nurses and other workers to guard inmates this is happening in texas it's happening in illinois and it's happening in a lot of other places but i just wanted to show that this is happening in other places outside of rikers but given that um it's still worth noting that it is happening in rikers and it's happening to this extent, and these places need to really be shut down, and this entire industrial complex needs to be broken down. So, with that said, um, these are the conditions that people are facing in Rikers Island and across the country. And while the media is constantly focusing on staffing shortages, we need to focus on shutting these institutions down. The prison industrial complex has been terrible and has had a drastic impact on people's lives uh, in combination with the war on drugs, the prison labor stuff that I talked about in the previous video. And all of this ends up bundling together into a system that ends up profiting off of keeping people in this system. And that is part and parcel to why a lot of these bails are set so high, because by keeping people in the system, you're able to make it so that there's always a good amount of workers to make the next batch of PPE and the next batch of hand sanitizer when New York State needs to call on it, or when any other state needs to call on uh, getting inmates to work for private companies. This is what they do. And this is the institution that we have been living with in supposedly the land of the free. There's been nothing free. Um, the incarceration rates in the United States are the highest in the world. It's absurd that we get away with what we do. Um, if it was any other country, we would look at this and say that this was a, uh, you know, massive problem. But the fact of the matter is, is no matter how horrific and inhumane it already was, there's always the potential for it to become worse. And the unfortunate reality is, because of the way that things have been handled around correctional officers, they've been taking it around, out even more on prisoners. And that doesn't mean we hire more correctional officers. It means we start shutting down prisons. We start getting people out of that, out of these institutions. The fact of the matter is most of the people in these institutions are probably innocents. A lot of them are facing sentencing. And we have to assume that they're innocent until they're proved guilty. And you can question the uh, industry and all of that and how judges are complicit in all of it. But until they're charged with something, they should not be in that uh, situation, and the bail is keeping them there. The truth is, this is all systemic. The high bail prices putting out are outrageously high to the point where people cannot afford to pay for them, especially people who are grown up in poverty or living in poverty. 
and then you funnel people through and you know when people are should be presumed to be innocent and lock them in cells where they're being crowded uh, and overcrowded during a pandemic with no proper PPE, no medical equipment available to them, and no masks, where they're being uh, not being fed, they're not being given water, they're not being medicated. In some instances, I know I didn't really go into this, but some patients, or some inmates rather, have been in places where they have actually been stuck in their own feces. That is the extent that we've been seeing with all of this. And people here would do much better with proper psychological and social work care instead of locking people in cells and abusing them. And naturally, the situation and the response from the state is hire more guards, send people to higher, you know, higher intensity prisons, send them off to these maximum state facilities instead of decarcerating, decreasing the prison population and dismantling the prison industrial complex and destroying how we treat people and changing the system for the better. So with that said, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button and the bell for notifications. You can follow me on Twitter and check out my Discord in the description down below. My name is Anarchist Tara, and I thank you for watching.